welcome. I'm Will. And I'm Alicia. This is Enter the Rabbit Hole. Each week we dive into and dissect the weird, the momentous, and the downright interesting. And today we're covering prisons? Prison programs? Yeah. Other P words? Well, I mean, definitely those two things. Um, yeah. How you doing? I'm good. I'm not in prison, so I'm doing excellent. Yeah, definitely. We're enjoying uh, freedom. Um, which is always lovely and desirable and a, a great way to live your life. Uh, apologies, uh, first up, because it has been a couple of weeks since we've posted, hasn't it? It's been a short hiatus. Hiatus? Hiatus? Unintentionally so. We just had a lot going on, uh, including a Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. And just some other, some other stuff. Yeah, we did have a different episode planned, and... W- much like the CIA series that we did when we covered Operation Midnight Climax, I dived head first into that, and it, it it was just so much information, and we were finding it really hard to put it into even like a three part series. Not only that, but we were finding it difficult emotionally. Yeah, because it was pretty heavy subject matter. I don't think we want to spoil it just now because it's something that we might cover at a later time. Um, But suffice it to say, we had to change tack a little bit, which is why we're back here today, ready to talk about prison programs. And I think it'd be fair to say that you were... It's not that I didn't want to cover this, but I think you chose this one primarily. Yeah, I've never been to prison I'm Which I can't tell because of obviously all your your prison tattoos, tattoos. yeah, tattoos, yeah, your tattoos <laughs> and and your prison sculpted body, yeah. as well. I know it's yeah. tough. I I'm hench. I I've got a lot of face tattoos, guys. Yeah, and lats for days. No, that that, that has nothing to do with. Prison. And you look tremendous in orange as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I feel very strongly about prison reform. I feel pretty strongly about the way that prisoners are treated in especially in in u.s prison systems i i hate it (laughs) i'm not a fan uh and so i thought it would be interesting to maybe take a a little more humane approach yeah and i think it'd be fair to say i i don't want to speak too much on your behalf but you have people in your personal life who have fallen foul of the law in the past Mm. and but there are still people that you care about yeah so there are people in my life who have been to prison, people who I may not, you know, there there are people who I am not super close to, but they are part of my family. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's just, it's ridiculous how much it can ruin your life. Mm-hmm. Even after you've served your time, you've, quote, paid your dues for, especially for nonviolent crimes, like drug-related crimes or something like that, just the, the huge toll it can have on your life. Yeah, which is something that comes up immediately when you start talking about uh, prison populations in the US or the number of people who are incarcerated for drug-related or non-violent crimes. Um, Speaking personally, uh, I used to work for a charity very, very briefly that worked with a lot of people who either had criminal records or who were fast uh, becoming or in danger of falling foul of the law. And we were working to try and help those people develop some healthier life skills rather than just throwing them on the scrap heap and saying, well, you know, you don't have great coping mechanisms, that's your problem. Or you've made some mistakes or made some bad decisions in your life. Well, like, the rest is up to you, essentially. The charity that I used to work for, I I know that this will be very trigger, triggering for anyone who, uh, any of our more conservative-leaning listeners... If but, you're conservative and you've gotten this far, like, good on you. Great to have you. Uh, but uh, yeah, we we would work with these individuals in their home communities for a little while. We'd talk about what was going on in their lives, maybe some of the things that they were doing in terms of uh, CV development so that they could get a better job, maybe get themselves a better education. And then just day-to-day things like how they were feeding themselves, how, like what their income looked like. And then when we felt like they were personally ready, so a lot of people who are still in the grips of drug and alcohol issues, which oftentimes does go hand in hand with having a criminal record, those people weren't necessarily ready for us, but we could work with them until they got to a point where we could take them out for a week or two in the wilderness with some wilderness experts who would 
teach them about things like camping and fishing and, you know, do things like kayaking or gorging or, you know, horse horse riding, all this kind of stuff. And I know it sounds like, again, if you're... It sounds really fanciful, right? But it's right. this idea of understanding that the world is bigger than the world that you know. Yeah. And that there are more opportunities for mm-hmm. you. And after I went out on one of those trips with, uh, it was one of our younger cohorts, so some of whom had maybe gotten in trouble with the cops previously, or had maybe dropped out of school and, and didn't have a lot going on. It, it was great. It was a really eye-opening experience. And you do genuinely see, even over the course of like five days, you see people change quite a lot when they're given a little bit of responsibility and they're they're taught how to take responsibility for their own actions. So yeah, that's I, th- I think that's why I was on board for doing this episode as well. Well, if you're listening, go ahead and follow the show and leave us a review. Good, bad, or ugly, we'd love to hear from you. Also, if you have any ideas for future episodes, please share them with us. You can find us on etrhthepod at gmail.com or etrhthepod on social media. So, uh, should we dive right in? Let's go. Yeah. We're going to be talking a lot about the the criminal justice system in the US today, and, and there's a reason for that. We're not singling out the US, or we're going to try not to single out the US unfairly. I For, for our listeners who don't know, I'm from the UK, specifically Scotland, and when you look at the criminal justice system in the UK and Scotland specifically, and also recidivism rates, which we're going to touch on a little bit later, they're also not fantastic. But... The U.S. in terms of uh, prison systems in the developed world is pretty much pretty ev- horrific. <laughs> yeah, every every metric you want to judge it by, it always seems to come out on the bottom. So that's why we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about that. Also, a lot of people banged up in the in the U.S. as well. There are a lot of prisoners. We should get this out of the way. There are. 2.3 million prisoners in the U.S. prison system, so that accounts for federal prisons, state prisons, and jail. If you don't know what the difference is, jail is where you go for very minor infractions, like if you're going to go to prison for less than a year, mm-hmm. um, or you're waiting for your conviction. Yeah, you, you could be waiting for your court date, mm-hmm. essentially. And uh, I think, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the statistics that I came across a couple of times were something like the U.S. has... About 5% of the world's population, but it accounts for 25% of the incarcerated individuals around the globe. It's absolutely insane. Yeah. Of course, we do all the figures that we're going to be presenting today when we're talking about global statistics. We'll say this up top. You do have to take them with a grain of salt because when you're talking about maybe more unstable parts of the world, maybe slightly less developed parts of the world, or specifically very secretive parts of the world, for example, North Korea. North Korea, we know have a lot of people who are incarcerated, but are <laughs> are they going to hand out accurate figures on how many people are banged up and, and for what? Probably not. Or places where they don't keep great records or the records aren't easily available. That too, 100%. Quickly, I wanted to mention that, as always, our sources are in the description. A lot of, especially my sources, come from like innocence projects, so like the Marshall Project or prison policy, these are left-leaning programs. Uh, And so a lot of my information comes from leftist views. I have tried to take some information from maybe more right-centered to give myself a more even approach, but that's just the way it falls. Um, I am more interested in the data that they have, so that's, that's the data that I found. Yeah. And I think we should also probably mention what uh, recidivism is before yeah, we so, dive into that. Um, recidivism broadly can be defined as falling back on negative actions, in this case, uh, falling back on criminal actions, which can either, because they're, these are two, two separate sets of figures, they can either end, end up in a, uh, an arrest or a conviction or going back into prison. There's some very subtle but important distinctions there when we talk about recidivism rates, but obviously that's an important metric because it shows from a a rehabilitation standpoint whether your time in prison has worked or not. Basically, it's it's only for people who have already been convicted. 
and they have served time, do they go back to prison or are there some sort of like punishment action taken towards them? Yeah, because I think we can all agree, left, right or centre, if somebody has spent time in prison and they get back out, then you don't want them to go back, right? Uh, you Nobody wants to see people going out and, and making the same mistakes time and time again. That's not good for anybody. It is then up to you whether you blame the individual for those actions or if you blame the the culture that has been nurtured around those individuals for not fostering, I guess, better decision making or, or more opportunities. But I guess that's what we're going to get into. Yeah, so without further ado, uh, according to the World Prison Brief, a resource for Institute for Crime and Justice Policy Research at Birkbeck University of London, uh, in 2018... There were 11 million prisoners worldwide. Uh, Again, we we do have to bear in mind that, you know, those are the figures that we're aware of. In all likelihood, it's probably more than that. The USA has around 2 million people in prison, the highest figures in the world. Also, it has the highest prison population rate per 100,000 people. So if you're talking about a per capita figure, the USA is still the, the highest worldwide. Okay, so its figures are above Rwanda, which has 580 people per 100,000, Turkmenistan, which has 576, El Salvador, which has 564, and Cuba, which has 510. Uh, Incidentally, Scotland is uh, number 112 on this list. Uh, Its prison population rate is 138 per 100,000. All those Neds. Yeah. (laughs) Do you want to explain what a net is? Uh, a non-educated delinquent? Yeah, which I think is probably a, more of an old school term nowadays. But um, for our for our American listeners, without casting any unnecessary aspersions, I, I guess it would be termed colloquially as white trash, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it's not all quote-unquote neds are bad people obviously yeah and the reason that i slipped scotland in there is obviously so that you understand that i'm I'm trying not to come at this from a purely biased point of view so according to data gathered by the pew center for this <laughs> are you laughing at the name uh, i'm laughing at the name yeah pew pew uh, <laughs> we're thinking about crime pew pew okay <laughs> that's 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 their plan for getting crime down yeah. just shooting people with tiny guns mm. uh that when you fire them they actually say the word bang yeah. Like, you see it. No, they say Pew. <laughs> <laughs> According to data gathered by the Pew Center of the States for the National Institute of Justice, one in 36 prison inmates in the USA are Hispanic men, and one in 15 are black men. So when you start to dig into the figures as well, you realize that it has uh, it, it skewed a little bit more towards ethnic minorities, non, non-white people. Uh, A 2019 update to a report uh, entitled A Systematic Review of Recidivism Rates Worldwide. It's going to be a (laughs) a lot of sexy sounding uh, papers in today's episode. Uh, According to that updated report, the authors noted difficulty in in comparing recidivism rate stats around the globe. Quote, In this systematic review, we have presented worldwide prisoner recidivism rates and found that only 10 out of 50 countries with the largest prison populations reported recidivism statistics for cohorts of released prisoners. This finding suggests that the lack of systematic and open approach towards recidivism research in many countries, despite its importance for public health and safety, the overall recidivism rates remain difficult to compare between countries because of significant variations in outcome, definitions, and reporting practices. Which is to say, we we are trying to do an apples for apples comparison here. A lot of other people have done similar comparisons based on the same platform, but it's inherently difficult to do. It's It's flawed. So basically what they're saying is that not all of the countries even report recidivism, And that recidivism is reported in a different way. With all of that in mind, two years after being released from prison, the reconviction rates for the USA on a federal level are 60%. It's not alone. New Zealand is also around about 60%, Sweden is 61%, and Denmark is 63%. Again, 
not being a person in a glass house throwing stones, uh, the UK figures at two years are unavailable, but the one-year mark sits between 37 and 48%, suggesting that the two-year mark would be, you know, sub- mm. substantially more. Uh, the lowest in the world are Norway at 20%, Austria at 26%, and Iceland at 27%. And uh, so those are some of the examples we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, I think it's also important to note uh, the the farther you go out, basically, like one year, two years, five years, most uh, stop reporting after five years, the recidivism rates go up. Of course, because it's... It's more time for someone to... To mess up, essentially. Yeah. Make a mistake, make some poor choices, and... Fall I subject to something in their life going wrong. You know, there's there's a lot of different contributing factors, but suffice it to say, you could be out of prison and your life could be actually looking pretty rosy in your first 12 months, 24 months, etc. But maybe something happens a few years down the line, and so you, you just become another statistic, essentially. <laughs> So I wanted to talk about why most of the U.S. system in particular doesn't really work. In the past, the U.S. has had a very hard-on-crime stance, and a lot of that is said to originate like around the Nixon era. So I wanted to have a quote from one of Nixon's speeches, and I'm not going to do the voice because I, I can't. <laughs> but feel free to uh, imagine it in the voice in your mind. Just yeah, like, yeah. just imagine just Alicia. Just some jowls. Like, <laughs> yeah. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. Pretty much every American president runs on a hard on crime stance. Yeah. Even uh, the hard Democrats, they're still, people are going to prison, people are going to jail, we're going to make sure these bad people go away. I think it was Bill Clinton who introduced the three strikes (laughs) and you are out. That's my Bill Clinton, by the way. It was pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. So according to Time magazine, from the 1960s to the 1980s, violent crimes soared 270% peaking at 750 violent offenses per 100,000 people in 1991. And people of color were 24% more likely to be victims of crimes than white Americans. Again, probably a plethora of reasons for that. You know, where different demographics are living within the U.S. Sure. Uh, Dense urban areas versus, uh, I don't know, farmland. Um... You know, poverty is a huge indicator of crime, unfortunately, or at least in the U.S. we have criminalized poverty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when people start suggesting things like, we should make camps for homeless people, and then you sit for, like, more than five seconds and think about what you just said. Yeah, it's pretty It's pretty messed up. And uh, outside of Seattle, we have what's called, I believe, Nickel Town, or Dime okay. Town. Um, and that's just, just like, for Nickelback fans. Yeah. Yeah. We like to say I, I'm on board them. with that. Round them up, man. You hey. like Chad Kroger? No? Okay, you're fine. You like Chad Kroger? Or you think he had a couple of good songs? Get in the fan. This is messed up, man. <laughs> I don't know that I'm on board. <laughs> I mean, I had a phase where I like Avril Lavigne. <laughs> Maybe you should get in the van. I think Avril Lavigne gets a pass. But didn't she marry Chad Kroger? No, my friend. Are we going to have to check this off air? Maybe. Okay, I want to say that she married the drummer of Sum 41. Let's pause and check that. Well, In a with, twist of fate. <laughs> wouldn't you know it, fact fans, we were both kind of right. So uh, apparently Avril Lavigne was married to the lead singer, not the drummer, of Sum 41 back in the noughties and is currently married is to she... Chad Kroger. Uh, no, they were married for two years. They got oh. engaged in after after her bout with uh, some forty one lead singer. Obviously, yeah, sure. They got they were married for two years. And then... She's got a type. She's got a type. It's the bleached hair, I think. 
You're listening to the Aging Millennial Hour, <laughs> presented by Will and Alicia. Thanks for tuning in. Okay. All uh, right. Let's get back to prisons. Yeah, on a lighter note. Okay. So, uh, this massive rise in crime, remember 270%, uh, led to a hard-on-crime stance. Lawmakers enacted stricter sentences. The war on drugs meant more minor drug offenses were seeing time in jail. And time in prison increased 33% in state prisons and by 50% in federal ones. What I will say about the war on drugs is that, I, I mean, the music just wasn't as good as the Vietnam War. I, I would say out of the two... Certainly a lot less Creedence Clearwater Revival. Yeah, I'm all about that CCR. <laughs> if you could be, like, busting down uh, people's front doors with CCR blaring, I mean, it wouldn't make it right, but it would probably make it more fun no nope. don't, don't do that to ccr <laughs> man <laughs> come not from the podcast okay okay imprisoning one person can range massively in costs because remember these are u.s state states have different laws and different amounts that they spend on prisoners and of course there are things like luxury white collar prisons but an average an inmate uh costs thirty four thousand dollars annually that's more than many Americans make. I believe that's above the poverty line. Yeah. Um, and imagine if instead of spending that money on incarceration, we spent that money on people who needed help. But, you know, whatever. Yeah. The The key thing here is not that we should take that money away from those prison inmates, because as I'm sure you're going to touch on shortly, that still ain't enough. Mm. But uh, maybe you have fewer of them, or for less time. Mm. Yeah. So taxpayers pay about $80 billion to fund prison systems, and they aren't alone. Family and friends of incarcerated people often bear the brunt of paying to stay in contact and keep their loved ones in minimal comfort. So this is taken from uh, the Marshall Project, and they're talking about specific accounts of people who have had to pay to stay in contact with their loved ones. So let's take the example of Talita Hayes, who puts in $200 a month to the commissary account of her ex-husband. So that's $2,161 in 2019. She's paid $3,586 in charges for talking to him on the phone when she cannot make the hour-long drive to the prison, and even emails cost money. She spent $419, to be exact, to send an email through the prison email system. Damn. And 200 more to talk to him during the holidays. So that's a total of $6,366 a year from Talita to her ex-husband, William Reese, who has been incarcerated for 28 years. That's $178,000 in total. The commissary thing I get, because the idea of the commissary, it, in in theory, it should be luxury goods for the inmates if they can afford it. In practice... So in theory, mm. it is for hygiene products. So they're supposed to get, like, bars of soap, enough for shampoo. They don't get enough. Some uh, inmates have said that they got basically, like, a wafer of soap that lasts them maybe, like, three showers. I'm only um, half joking about this. I wonder if they are worried about them putting too many of them in a sock and uh, beating each other silly. They probably don't worry about stuff like that. In I retract that even, sentence. They're 100% <laughs> not worried about prisoners beating each other. They don't, they don't care other. about that. Um, even if that were an issue, if that were their worry, they could offer more soap, you know, like, um, different times. Sure. They could do those little... Um, like rings of soap that you get in hotels and you you're like you have to keep telling yourself it's not mint don't eat it don't put it in your mouth it's not gonna taste like what you think why did you do that why'd you put that in your mouth i don't know but you always dumb end up with dumb, a mouthful of will. bubbles <laughs> yeah um but yeah a lot of uh incarcerated people say it's basically like hotel soap like that's how much they're given for like a month yikes so they will often have to use their uh, commissary funds to buy hygiene products. They are also used to buy extra food and snacks because the prison commissary isn't enough. Like, they don't get enough food. Coming back to paying for 
phone calls, I can almost understand paying for phone calls because somebody has to pay the phone bill at the end of the day, but an email? Come on, like how do you how do you justify that? And obviously, do you like do you justify that? Because it's not like you can complain to a customer service representative and choose a different prison for your for your loved one to be incarcerated. Yeah. And you he, either like it or lump it. Herein lies a massive issue in the US prison system because you are taking a huge cost, like the cost of phone bills, and putting it onto the family members. So if you want to stay in contact with your loved ones, you have to pay. What does that amount to? It amounts to the end of familial or community ties to incarcerated people so that when they leave prison, they don't have anywhere to go or anyone to talk. Like, or they don't have a support network. Or let's say that you choose to do it. You have that additional cost. monetary pressure. And that person who could have been paying into your life yeah. is, is you've lost that sort precisely. of income as well. Precisely. This could be a dad, it could be an older brother, it could be a husband, somebody who Or a mom. Yeah. Or an aunt. Could be the primary breadwinner, but they're gone. They're out of the system. And I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about this as well, but they are they're earning maybe a, a small amount of income but nowhere near the same amount as they would in, in the, the free world. Mm -hmm. So another... Sorry, and I, I, I know I've put Neil Diamond in everyone's head now. <laughs> another major issue is the incarceration of nonviolent offenders. So 51% of incarcerated people in state and federal jails, sorry, state and federal prisons, are there for nonviolent offenses. Not to mention that breaking into an empty house or snatching a purse is labeled as a violent offense. Uh, the average time spent in prisons in 2016 was one to two and a half years for nonviolent offenses. So basically what I've looked at is this m massive chart, which I will post onto the Instagram, which has a breakdown of all all of the like the crimes so like property crime you know um theft and all that all that sort of thing broken down into state prisons federal prisons and jail um with the amount of of prisoners and i've done a very cursory thing of just looking at all of the numbers and taking away all the ones that don't say violent Obviously, it doesn't work that way because somebody could be in prison for a weapons charge as a means to get them off the street because they know that a violent crime is going to be committed. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a ton of nuances. I'm not saying that every <laughs> every person in in jail or prison is a good person, but I am saying that there are a lot more people in prison than, strictly speaking, need to be there. So... There's a an interesting time a Times Magazine article that offers a more conservative estimate of 39% of incarcerated people who don't need to be there. This is accounting for seriousness of crime, victim impact, intent, and likelihood for recidivism. They found 25% were minor offenders that would be better served by treatment, community service, or probation. And 14% have served long sentences already and can be safely set free. My 51% doesn't include jail. In Texas, 524,000 people were jailed in 2018 for unpaid traffic tickets. Short stays in jail can cause a person to lose their job, lose custody of their child, cause a person to simply not be able to make enough to pay rent. And that's all for a traffic ticket. We've all been there. You're definitely looking for a parking spot. Some dickhead has parked right over two, two spaces. Do they deserve to be incarcerated for that? Okay, arguably yes. But also maybe no. It brings to mind that uh, meme from Parks and Rec where they have the... Uh, president of some made-up Central American... <laughs> straight to jail. <laughs> straight to jail. Unpaid parking tickets, straight, straight to, to jail. jail. <laughs> but that's, joking aside, that's what we're talking about here. And how many other countries, not only in the developed world, how many other countries in the world, full stop, will give you prison time for just essentially not putting money back into police forces or local councils via 
parking fines mm-hmm. or via uh, traffic tickets. You know, these can be things for, you know, speeding. Um, maybe your your back light is out because you can get a, a fine for having a, a light fail. Um, you could get a fine for uh, for an unpaid meter. And basically what's happened is that these people haven't paid their fines or can't afford to pay their fines, and they've added up. And that causes a warrant to be issued for their arrest. I wonder how often these will be uh, police uh, forces trying to pick up somebody for a different reason. It can be. It can be, like, it it can be profiling. It can be, um, if you have, like, an unpaid parking ticket, nobody's going to come to your house and arrest you. But say, for example, you have, like, three unpaid parking tickets and a warrant has been issued for your arrest and then you're pulled over for speeding or for or for nothing and all the police officer does is is run your plates and see oh there's a warrant out for your arrest so yeah. it doesn't matter what the warrant is for it it just matters that you're going you're going to jail and, and you have to pay to get out of you know on bail and the cop does that thing where they pull you over and they're like any idea why I pull you over and they're like I don't know and it's like Oh, well, you got back taillight out, and you're like, what taillight? And the officer takes his flashlight and just smashes things like that one. Get in the ground. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're laughing because it's so sad. Mm. Okay, re-entry into society is yet another place where my country drops the ball, especially when it comes to violent offenders. If we hold true to the belief that prison should be both a punishment and rehabilitation, then we have massively failed on the second count. When an inmate is released, depending on the state, they may receive anywhere from $10 to $200 spending money. Some of that may be deducted for clothing and transportation, and that amount hasn't increased as the cost of living has gone up. In 1973, the $200 California gave as an inmate was released from prison was worth $1,200 in today's money. Some states take money out of the prisoners' wages, while others reserve 10% of whatever their family or friends send them in order to have $1,000 in reserve. So that means a family would have to send $10,000 before the state stopped taking money. It's like a a layaway program. Like, someday you want your uncle to be released from prison. So you put a little down payment now and a little down payment next month, and someday he'll be able to afford a bus ticket. (laughs) To get home to his loved ones. It's so insane. Like, prison costs so much money. And arguably, you're not getting... Like, so originally my idea for this episode was to look into the the prison programs, uh, things that, that we do in order to help prisoners upon their release. Mm-hmm. So um, we watch videos about, like, acting classes in prison or, like... Horse riding in prison. Yeah, or... things that would help teach them, like, more responsibility or to get in touch with their emotions or, or yeah. things like that. Um, to be clear, the horse riding is not actually, like, in the cell. They don't bring a horse into your cell and then you're like, make them gallop. And like, I don't know how. <laughs> uh, no, it's actually uh, teaching them to be horse trainers, which is it was fascinating. Yeah, and, and real powerful stuff as mm-hmm. well. Um, and all of those programs are, are really worthwhile, but after doing the research, like, it's real surface level stuff. I mean, how many people can you actually help? How many people can you actually take to train horses? Not very many. And how many people are actually going to be able to take this acting class? Again, not very many. It's also possible to be very cynical. Again, if you're looking at this through a conservative lens, and look at that and, and be like, well, they should what? be having fun. Yeah, and also... Like acting? Oh, well, you said you were teaching them valuable life skills. So what? They're all going to be horse trainers? They're going to enter the horse training economy? They're going to enter the burgeoning amateur dramatic economy? So I get that. But you have to take a step back and look at the transferable soft skills that you can develop this. Number one being not always feeling like you're a complete piece of shit. Mm. And that you're capable of doing things which aren't just hurting other people. Yeah, I mean, basically, we will talk about it more, but punishment is supposed to be you do not have the freedom to go wherever you want, whenever you want. Mm -hmm. And we've taken that and increased the punishment a hundredfold. You know, you don't have any private space. 
You don't have any comforts. You don't have any space for yourself, like emotionally speaking, uh, or safe spaces. And the toll that that can take on a person, just imagine like the toll that we, it, it took during the pandemic and lockdown. Yeah. You know, that was hard enough. And also maybe you're okay with a violent uh, murderer being housed with other people who are likely to physically or sexually assault that individual. Maybe you're okay with that. Maybe you're okay with um, pedophiles or uh, sex offenders being put in that similar situation. Are you okay with somebody who... Your buddy Craig, who had like 10 ounces of marijuana on him. Exactly. Like somebody on a minor possession charge or somebody like even something as minor as like shoplifting, right? You know, I'm not going to pretend that everyone who's housed there is uh, stealing bread to feed their family, Mm -hmm. but come on. And a lot of these people as well are under the age of 25. So, (laughs) I mean, like, I still make pretty, pretty disastrous decisions on a daily basis. Um, you know, and I'm a fully grown man. <laughs> it's why I have to tell myself uh, every day in the mirror. Everybody knows 25 year olds aren't fully grown. Yeah. I believe 25 is actually the stage in which um, brains are finally fully developed. I, I Well, I think there is some, some research now mm. to support that as well. What up to our under 25 listeners? <laughs> uh, hey You're there, Gen adult. Z. <laughs> Enjoy. Yeah. I, I hope you like the show. <laughs> Okay, um, parole is uh, another reason for high recidivism. Say, for example, a parolee is living with their grandmother. The grandmother dies, and now the parolee is homeless and slips back into drug use. Instead of going to treatment, the parolee goes straight to jail. A parole officer speaking to the New Yorker said, quote, If there's a way to lock somebody up, if somebody has any kind of infraction, anything where a warrant could be issued, We have to issue a warrant. Even if the officer wants to use their discretion, they no longer have that ability. Even though New York City's jail population is declining, the amount of people detained for parole violations has gone up. And this is what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about those different kinds of recidivism rates because recidivism does not always equate to ending up back in prison. Um, It can be something as simple as you have inadvertently not jumped parole. What's the word I'm looking for here? Like you broken. Yeah, you've you've broken the the terms of your parole. You 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 violated your parole. And think about some of the terms of parole. Like you're not allowed to have contact with anybody else who what who is on parole or who has like a past as a criminal. Imagine everybody that you know has been to jail. You know, maybe your your father or your mom has, has spent some time in prison. So what are you supposed to do? Where are you supposed to go? You're not allowed to see those people. And yet you don't have enough money to pay for a place on your own. I hear a lot of people are playing uh, Apex Legends nowadays uh, or Fortnite. So to make some you know, money. <laughs> I wonder, I again, I'm only half joking here, but if you... Uh, hypothetically speaking, you're out on parole and you're online gaming, but you happen to be gaming with somebody else who is on parole. Is that a violation? I I have no idea. <laughs> I so in case you're unaware, a parole officer can search your home at any time. They can search your place of work at any time. So let's not even mention like how difficult it is to get a job as as a person with a conviction. Um. To then have, like, your job be subject to a law enforcement search any time the parole officer wants to. Who who wants to keep that kind of person on their staff? Absolutely. Okay. Um, to kind of give a counterpoint to this, there is an opinion piece entitled, quote, Beyond Bars, Parole is Not Impossible if You Follow the Rules in the Standard Examiner. It's a, a right center newspaper from Utah. This piece is written by a parolee kind of bemoaning the fact that his fellow prisoners can't stay on the straight and narrow. He's he's saying that basically everybody he knows who's on parole just keeps getting sent back for slipping back into drug use, for alcohol, their like desperate need to get high. 
The writer says, quote, I definitely have had it much easier than most, but I also have not made it harder on myself. I read this article and, yeah, I think most of us who who think about this kind of thing, well, it should be easy. You know, you just don't have to do drugs, don't have to see certain people, you know, just stay on the straight and narrow and after a couple of years, you'll be off parole. I think what this speaks to, the the first part where he says... Uh, I definitely have had it much easier than most. How how valuable do you think that is? Because are we falling into the fallacy of thinking that everyone is starting from the same place? It's like if you turn around, if you are in great shape and you're like, I don't understand all these fatties walking around and stuffing their face and then complaining about like, oh, I'm so fat, oh, I can't do a chin up. It's like, yes, but maybe you have better genetics. Maybe you have more money to go to a gym on a regular basis. Maybe you have more time to go to a gym on a regular basis. Or you have access to better food. There are a myriad of little things, which means that you are not starting from the same place as that person. There was a a video that we watched. uh, It was by The Economist, and it was called Prison, How to Break the Cycle of Reoffending. And in that uh, video, they follow a man who's being released from prison. He is kind of like a constant reoffender. He is in he's what in his fifties? Yeah, I believe so. But he looks like he is much older. In his seventies, yeah. Yeah. Um and there's a scene where he gets released, so the prisoners are given clothes and like twenty They're, they're given like a mesh bag with all their basically all the all their belongings. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and You see the families who are out waiting for their loved ones to be released and all the people getting reunited. And then the rest of the people have to just walk past them to get into buses that are going to take them to halfway houses that they only have access to for a couple days. And by the way, they have to pay for these halfway houses and they have to like they're given a bus ticket and... As soon as he gets off the bus, he's lost his mesh bag. He's lost his ticket. There's obviously something else going on here. Yeah. We're, we're not talking about a person with fantastic life skills. Maybe doesn't have a particularly high IQ. Mm-hmm. And I think what we've alluded to a number of times as well, um, you could also have people who have the additional complication of mental health issues, mm-hmm. which my understanding is ever since the Reagan administration public mental health facilities in the USA have essentially been dismantled. And so all you have access to are paid for facilities or paid for care, which is just beyond a lot of people, assuming that you even have that in your immediate vicinity. And so much like the homelessness situation, you could do a lot in terms of reducing homeless numbers or unstable housing numbers in the US if you did more in terms of mental health care. I imagine that the the exact same is true of the prison population. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So to then expect, well, I, you know, I hope you've enjoyed your X number of years inside and that they've been really good for your mental development. Go back in the, <laughs> into the world where you failed the first time around. It's so ridiculous. It's just like, well, here's, even if you consider the max like $200, good luck. Who? What are your options if you don't have family? In this economy? <laughs> I just wanted to throw that in there for the sake of it. But yeah, $200 does not get you very far. Um, you could head over to IHOP. I hear that they have some fantastic deals for like $10. You can basically get an all-you-can-eat breakfast, um, which is wonderful. I This isn't an ad for an IHOP. This is more an admission of my secret dirty, dirty love for... Uh, American diners, especially of the chain variety, um, I, I, I just, I just love it. I mean, it's not like you shouldn't, you shouldn't live off of that <laughs> stuff. No, no, no. It's not a lifestyle. But like, if you are just say on holiday in the U.S., uh, I'm, I'm definitely up for swinging by an IHOP. And then Alicia I mean, looks at me like ugh. I'm filth. I hate IHOP. Yeah. I hate it. I mean, even like. I Denny's is like a worse version, but a, there's something that redeems it with like its grittiness factor. That like <laughs> what <laughs> they put grit in the food? Yeah, grits. you just eat it right. Oh, I, oh, that's <laughs> oh, that's how you make grits. You literally just go outside and sweep up some gravel. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Denny's used to be open. I don't know if they still are. They used to be open until like 
two in the morning. Oh, that kind of great factor. Yeah. yeah. Well, those people are up past 11. <laughs> well, <laughs> who knows what they could be up to? Oh, they could be up to anything. Oh, oh they could be eating gravel. Probably driving their their Cadillacs around down to the reservoir to race in their leather jackets. Oh. Pink slips. <laughs> All right. Um... <laughs> Alright, so I think we've talked long and hard about uh, recidivism rates in the US and things that are wrong with the, the prison system in the US. So what do you do? What are your options? Just what... don't go to prison, obviously. <laughs> Just don't do crimes, kids. Um, or mm. you can look at some of the systems that they have in other countries and see maybe what people are, are doing right. Maybe what, what people are doing differently. So... We're going to focus on a couple of Scandinavian countries for the the reasons that we were talking about earlier, um, because typically they, they tend to have lower recidivism rates. So there are many countries with lower recidivism rates than the USA. Some people could say that it's as simple as liberal euro system versus USA system. In a 2014 article from Business Insider by Erin Fuchs, she highlights six reasons why Prison in Europe is better than America. She focuses on prisons in Germany and the Netherlands. These are rehab as a goal, more autonomy, connections to society, different treatments for young offenders, rare use of solitary, and shorter sentences. That sounds great. It does, doesn't it? And when you think about it, these are areas where the U.S. prison system and many other prison systems are falling short. I mean, let's look at number one, rehab is a goal. A lot of people would argue that punishment should be the goal rather than rehabilitation. And I get that, especially if you are the victim of a crime. However, it is a little bit short-sighted, I would argue. It's short-term gain, potentially, for the, for the victims, people who have been affected, over long-term gain for society at large. Yeah, I think a good way of looking at it is I hate rapists. I hate anybody who rapes somebody, however... It's a hot take, but okay. <laughs> I know. I know nobody agrees with me. Yeah. But would I rather uh, that person gets punished and then released because they will be released and then does it again? Or would I prefer them to lessen the punishment, and focus more on re rehabilitation so that person doesn't do it again. Yeah, do you want somebody who is just more embittered and angrier who's coming out uh, further down the line, or do you want someone who's actually learned from their experience? Potentially, because mm -hmm. none of that is guaranteed, of yeah, course. of course not. Um, and then if we look further down the list, uh, rare use of solitary, that's not to say that solitary confinement is never used in European prisons. It's just to say that in the USA, it's more routinely used, and for longer periods of time as well, which I believe under the United Nations, they, they've they classified the use of solitary confinement over prolonged periods of time as a form of torture. Yeah. And I get it, because you're, the human brain needs stimulus. When it's deprived that stimulus, it starts to break <laughs> irreparably. Very quickly, people in solitary hallucinate. Yeah. Uh, and then the last thing, shorter sentences as well, because bear in mind that, again, this comes back to the law itself. Uh, the the length of time that you should serve for carjacking versus arson versus sexual assault, all of these, to a certain extent, are arbitrary. You start with a certain number, and then you either go up or down from that. There is no fixed figures. There's no there's no reason that somebody needs to serve a life sentence for committing certain crimes and we're going to talk about certain examples of that. So although all of these are potentially beneficial, it's worth noting how these recidivism rates look in these countries. So the Netherlands at the two-year mark, two years after being released, is 46%. And Germany at three years is also 46%. So coming back to that statement earlier of US systems versus European systems, 
it's not as cut and dry as that. It comes down to individual countries and individual prisons as well. Uh, so the first example we're going to look at is uh, Iceland, which, as we were saying earlier, has a recidivism rate of around 27%. Sorry, I'm laughing because there is a title that uh, Will has very deftly... Yep. <laughs> and I will say that shortly. So in a 2018 article for The Independent, Professor of Criminology Frank Pakes visited and stayed at two prisons in Iceland. Kvia Brigia was the first. Nice. I don't... I guess. Well, we don't know. <laughs> uh, but... You gave it the old let, college try. Let's call it Kvabrigia. I feel like I did it better the first time, right? Mm-hmm. So this is one of Iceland's open prisons. Staff and prisoners live and work side by side. Everyone has their own cell. Most leave their cells unlocked. Prisoners have access to Wi-Fi and they have access to mobile phones. Quote, It was clear from the outset that prisoners and staff do things together. Food is important in prisons and in Kvia Brigia, the communal dining room is a central space. It is where prisoners have breakfast, lunch and dinner together with staff. Prisoners cook the food and with an officer, they do the weekly food shop in a nearby village. Food it was plentiful and tasty. It is considered bad form not to thank the prisoner chefs for their efforts, and you have to clean up after yourself. A lot to unpack there. Yeah, you're talking about like not breeding resentment between staff and prisoners. I mean, I assume that most of the prisons that we're talking about are low, like like low level prisons for more minor crimes. We're not, actually. Some no. of, some of the prisons we're going to be talking about house very violent offenders in their countries, what would be considered the, the worst of the worst. Uh, and we're also not talking about places that haven't been affected by things like gun crime or terrorism as well. So it would be a misnomer to assume that, you know, only good boys get to have mobile phones and, and Wi-Fi. I think it's an important distinction to note that You know, prisoners can be very violent and, Mm -hmm. you know, this could be potentially dangerous for staff members. Mm -hmm. But what you are doing is creating an environment where people, people who know each other are less likely to go to war. You can say that about a number of different circumstances as well. Uh, Children who end up in the foster care system, arguably, they're more likely to be prone to violence or more likely to be prone to uh, things like stealing. Does that mean that you, sh- you just shouldn't foster kids because you're you're a higher likelihood of that happening. Mm, no, because then what happens with these individuals? So it's not to say that violent instances never happen. These staff members will will talk a little bit about the training that that goes into uh, the prison system in in Norway in a moment. But they are very well trained. Typically, train longer than. Uh, prison officers in the US system so they're ready to deal with any of these encounters but you could look at it as not pouring not pouring fuel in the fire Mm -hmm. right distancing yourself and creating more of an us versus them dynamic could potentially lead to more instances of, of violence um yeah, the whole thing about them eating together and the prisoners having like a more active role and day-to-day running of the prison. Learning responsibility, basically. I think it's very valuable and being treated as individuals rather than just being treated as inmates. So uh, Professor Pakes goes on to say, quote, it was the informality of the interactions that struck me most. We watched football together. Rather than being shy or furtive, I saw sex offenders shouting at the screen where Iceland played. Vulnerable prisoners were having banter with drug dealers. I saw problematic drug users chatting and giggling with staff. And I felt I fitted in, both as a researcher and as a person. I got teased a bit, of course, as all prison researchers do. But prisoners also shared gossip, and many prisoners and staff alike shared very personal, even intimate feelings and stories with me. The The thing about sex offenders really struck out, stuck out for me because... Not just in the US, I think it'd be fair to say in prisons around the world, if you are in for any kind of sexual offence, whether it be statutory rape, uh, or whether it be, God, I don't know, public masturbation, what, whatever, you are in the bottom rung. 
and you are fair game and you are you are likely to to be a target of violent mm-hmm. assault uh again maybe you're the kind of person who feels that if somebody has been convicted for something like pedophilia then lock them away throw away the key whatever they do to them fair game but there are a lot of people who could come under that umbrella and again that that is a way of looking at it purely from a punishment rather than a rehabilitation standpoint and maybe the first step in that rehabilitation is allowing those people to feel like they're still human i guess interact with other people i don't i mean i'd i'd love to see how that works in practice mm-hmm. right because we know that in everyday life if you were sat in a pub and somebody was like oh there's big jim he's a sex offender do you want to go and sit next to him and watch the football i would probably <laughs> say no i'm okay thank you <laughs> and i consider myself to be a pretty open minded person um so the idea that this can happen in prison of all places is it's pretty powerful stuff uh so the gold standard for most people however isn't iceland it's norway they have comparable rates for reincarceration to the US, 26% versus 28.8%, but drastically different rearrest rates. In Norway, the rearrest rate is 20% over two years versus 68% uh, over three years in the US. So even if you're meeting in the middle, that, mm-hmm. that is considerably uh, a, a much higher percentage in the US. I... Do you think that there are some things to take an account for? Like, even if we were to completely switch over to, like, a, a these kind of systems, we always have, like, basically structural inequality and, and racism. It's not necessarily fair to compare, like, a homogenous country with uh, a country which is made up of a lot of different classes and, and types of people. I'm saying that I would love to get to where Norway is in terms of like... This, this is a conversation that we were having the other day. Uh, Scotland at the moment has a nationalist government. So they're run by the Scottish Nationalist Party. If you don't know what that means, you could be mistaken for thinking that we are living in some kind of neo-fascist state where we don't like ethnic minorities and we don't like people who have a different skin color or a different accent from us, and we we want to send them all home. And that's not that's not what the SNP is all about. You can criticize them for their policies, absolutely, but they're not an inherently not a neo-fascist. Party. <laughs> <laughs> they're not a racist organization. Now, I think part of the and and we don't have very strong right leaning politics in Scotland. It's not that it doesn't exist full stop, but you don't see it to the same extent that you see in other parts of even other parts of the UK, I would argue. Part of the reason for that, you could say that Scottish people are just super nice and we like people and we like people of different uh from all different walks of life, all different parts of the world. However, I have to acknowledge, and you you've kind of made me aware of this as well. It's very easy to do that when you come from a tiny part of the world where there aren't many people to begin with, and the people that you are sharing space with are predominantly the same skin color as you, predominantly have the same background as you, predominantly, you know, we have a shared culture. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot easier to be open-minded when you're being open-minded from the other side of the fence. But... Again, I think there are a lot of be le- lessons to be learned. Absolutely, here. doesn't invalidate anything. I mm-hmm. I just think it's uh, an important counterpoint. To sure, make. absolutely. Uh, so let's look at our next example. According to author Baz Dreisinger from her 2017 book Incarceration Nations: A Journey to Justice in Prisons Around the World, 30 percent of Norway's prisons are open. No bars, no cells, minimal security. Life is made to look, more or less, like a reflection of the outside world. So the idea for open prisons was born in Finland in the 1930s. Uh, In her book, she visits the prison island of Bastoy in Norway. Nicknamed by some as the IKEA prison, 
it, <laughs> for its sleek Swedish looking minimalist design. Everything has a weird name and they have to build the cells themselves or the doors or whatever. Well, that's that's <laughs> how they learn those life skills is by building their own furniture. Oh my god, that's why there are no prison cells. It's because they have to build them themselves. <laughs> Side note, uh, earlier, we, off off air, Alicia and I were talking about where I went to university in Sterling and my first year at Sterling University and how I shared a kitchen with 14 people. Everybody had like a tiny section of the cupboard. Everyone had like a shoebox sized locker inside of a full sized fridge and the lockers didn't lock. And it was, let's say, minimalist. We're talking white breeze block and very like functional furniture you had a very small desk you had a very thin mattress uh overhead lockers and and like kind of like a small everyone had like a small room that looked more like a cell and the popular scuttlebutt and to this day i do not know if this is true but everybody that you spoke to in first year would be like oh you're staying in murray hall oh yeah looks like a prison doesn't it yeah the um the halls of residence here were designed by a Swed- Swedish prison architect. If that was the case, surely they would be much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, and we'd have much more fun names. Uh, oh, you're staying in Jürgenblatt uh, <laughs> Hall. Yeah, that's the party hall. Oh, good old Jürgenblatt. I'm all over in Schmirgelbarm. Um <laughs> Who's that chef always running around? <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing things left, right, and center. Um you can't go and check because they've since been demolished. And to be honest, even though I had a lot of fun uh, in my in my first year at uni, uh, it, it's probably for the best. I never lived in dorms, and that was the correct decision, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Boring. Uh, all right, so a quote from Baz Dreisinger in, uh, from her book. Uh, quote, my guide, Lassa Anderson, a jolly little man who's the prison's inspector for operations and community relations, seems almost disappointed when I'm neither surprised nor appalled by what he proudly presents. Not by the absence of prison uniforms and bars, nor the gorgeous shared housing units with their stainless steel countertops, wraparound sofas, chic coffee tables, and long vertical windows designed to admit optimum sunlight. Not by the stylish prison yard adorned with funky graffiti-style murals, courtesy of local artist Dolk Lundgren, not yeah. Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> no, I don't think Dolph Lundgren left action movies to become a prison artist, but but that would be that'd be an interesting third act for him. Uh, no, Dolph Lundgren. Uh, not the immaculate gym with its climbing wall, the friendly prison choir practicing Woody Guthrie's piece. Not the knitted art in the wall featuring po- poems by Pablo Neruda and W. H. Auden. Oh, Pablo Neruda is my favorite art author. <laughs> That's your jam. That's my favorite uh, poet. Sure. I mean, this sounds like if you read, we've we've done a lot of house hunting recently, uh, in in preparation for moving to the UK. Uh, if you read all of this, underneath, I'm in. Yeah, woo! Oh Lock god! Lock me up, officer! Oh god! You had me at wraparound sofa. Um, <laughs> it sounds idyllic to mm. us, and uh, clearly her guide in this prison was looking for the shock factor that you probably get from a lot of normies mm-hmm. uh, who expect to see 20-foot walls and barbed wire. I mean, of course there's always that kind of gut reaction of, I don't even live that well, <laughs> uh, why should you right, get to live some. that well? <laughs> well, you know, if you just like burn down a corner shop and then get uh, convicted. But I think the <laughs> issue here it should never be to bring somebody down. Right. No. I, I mean, it's like so many other, um, I don't want to use the term social justice movements, but I'm mm-hmm. going to use the term social adjustment movements for for, uh, for shorthand. It's it's like so many of these uh, movements for reform in, in our society, they're about raising other people up, not pulling other people down to make yourself look taller. So, yeah, I, I completely agree. And in summation, everybody should have a wraparound sofa. It's your God-given <laughs> right to sit when you want to sit, but also lie down when you want to lie down. And, and always make full use of the space. And always being within the eye line of the television. So Bastoy was opened in 2012. It costs around $252 million to build. It houses around 259 men and roughly the same number of staff. Interesting. One of the reasons that they are probably able to do this is that sentences are shorter 
sentences on average are around eight months versus 2.6 years in the US. Also, it's partly self-sufficient. They grow around 25% of their own food and recycle as much as possible, and all the vehicles on site are electric. The prison is surrounded by forests and pastures full of farm animals. Inmates are allowed to see their families on a regular basis in bright, inviting communal spaces, complete with books and toys for children that are designed to look more like playpens than prison yards. Dreisinger interviews the governor, Tom, who has a very dim view of US prisons and blames them for Norway's previous stance of being ultra-tough on offenders. They were this way up until 1998. Now they're much more liberal in their approach. Tom's ethos is this. If you treat people like shit, they will act like shit. Quote, I tell people, we're releasing neighbours every year. Do you want to release them as ticking time bombs? Is that who you want living next to you? That's an excellent ideology. I mean, right. these people have to... The majority of people are not going to die in prison. They're not going to be there for their entire life. These people are going to be your neighbors. They're going to be the people in the grocery store with you. You can either be on board with them being a good neighbor, or you can treat them terribly, and what are they going to do in the grocery store? This is why I think this is so much more than a philosophical or ethical conversation about good and bad, uh, punishment, fitting the crime, etc. To me, it's more a conversation about simple economics, taking a short-term view versus a long-term view. Short-term ve- benefits versus long-term gains. And, and I, th- I think he makes a very good point. He goes on to say that he makes no effort to hide his identity or distance himself from inmates. Many of them know his address and the names of his children. That is some (laughs) next level shit right there. When you're showing pictures of your kids and you're like, oh, little Jimmy made it to like, uh, you know, he's on the soccer team this year. Yeah. (laughs) Little Judy at the uh, elk milking contest. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Uh, But the point is that you're showing some real trust in these people that you're housing. All right, so our next example from Norway uh, is another example of Norway's liberal approach to prisons, uh, a place named Halden. It's actually a supermax prison designed to house the country's worst offenders. Not as open and idyllic as Bastoy, but you could still be mistaken for thinking it's a home for troubled teens rather than a cage for hardened criminals. Christopher Zaukis, author of Federal Prison Handbook, The Definitive Guide for Surviving the Federal Bureau of Prisons and College for Convicts, The Case for Higher Education in American Prisons. Ooh, cut it down. <laughs> oh, those are two, two different books. Oh, those okay. are two different books. Uh, writes about it in a 2017 article for the Huffington Post. Quote, The sole goal of Halden is rehabilitation, and to that end, no expense is spared on art to create a beautiful and inspiring atmosphere, bright and airy cells with enclosed en-suites, bar-free windows, excellent workout facilities, a peaceful treed yard with chessboards and benches, and other such niceties. The prison guards are trained to motivate, not intimidate inmates, and robust vocational programming, on-site medical and paramedical facilities keep the prisoners' bodies and minds in good working order. I think we talked about this off-air, but in the Huffington Post article, they uh, they wrote about tree-lined yards with cheese boards. <laughs> it was ob- Obviously, they'd misspelled chess boards, and I was like, whoa, fucking, all right. <laughs> all right for some. A <laughs> little bit of brie, a little yeah. bit of cabin bear. I was talking about how... Uh... How do they fill them up? They're just like constant cheese boards lingering around on like stumps. And there's just a guy who like rushes in to fill up the cheese board when it's getting emptied. Little known fact, part of the prison officer's training, I think it's after how to uh, successfully incapacitate one of the inmates is uh, cheese pairings. Mm. Yeah. Wine pairing is a separate course. You normally do that in year two. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's like a separate module. But, this is uh, more like nuts and honey and yeah, what kind of yeah. meats pair well. What kind of olive oils are mm-hmm. you getting there? Are they, are they herbed or unherbed? Um, it's, it's, it's complex. 
So Zaukas refers to vocational training, uh, and the vocational training that he refers to is a recording studio with a professional mixing board. (laughs) They have a music teacher who refers to the inmates as pupils, never prisoners, uh, and they launched their first musical in 2010. And was it good? Uh, I mean, I don't know. (laughs) Look it up, let us know. (laughs) The important thing is they had fun. Uh, They also have what they refer to as a kitchen laboratory where inmates learn about nutrition and cooking with options for courses as chefs, waiters, and caterers. That's pretty important stuff. Yeah. Uh, This makes sense. In 2007, the Norwegian government went even further in prison reform to place emphasis on helping inmates secure jobs after prison. Something else that we would find unusual, half of Halden staff are women. This is common in Norway and other European prisons. The philosophy is that, again, they're helping men prepare to integrate into mixed society. Having an entirely sex-segregated prison is not helpful for doing that. The governor of Halden also believes it helps reduce the stress and encourage good behaviour, which I think there's something to that. I don't know. if There's probably some bro science to back this up, that if you get too many men together in an enclosed space that testosterone goes through the roof and before you know it everyone's arm wrestling and having push-up competitions gotta have that feminine energy (laughs) yes exactly (laughs) no but it is important to see well you're seeing women for one and i don't want to say like a position of power but in a position of authority like because they're staff members yeah and you need to learn how to treat them correctly Mm -hmm. you know and you can't just only see men as authority figures for you know, a long period of time, Mm -hmm. you have to be able to see people on an equal level. Yeah, 100%. And I think it also speaks to what what we were discussing earlier about having too much homogeneity in Mm -hmm. one environment. It's not a good thing. You need to encounter a a real mix of different different types of people, different types of culture, etc. And learn how to respond to that in a constructive, non-violent way. Um, I, I'm sure some of these female prison officers get catcalled. I'm sure some of them have, you know, maybe felt themselves to be, uh, physically in danger at times. That being said, they're offered an opportunity to go into that line of work. And from, from what I understand, it's a pretty competitive career choice for, for people in Norway. Furthermore, the prisoners have access to world-class health and dental care. You don't don't think, even have that. Don't think, it, yeah, I don't think I need to even <laughs> say any more about that, really. <laughs> Whatever, let's go to the next place. <laughs> yeah, all right, so my, uh, my last example here. Uh, the difference are most apparent when staff from a U.S. penal system get to see Norwegian prisons firsthand. This is as described in a 2009 article, again from the Huffington Post. When describing Ringeriki prison in Norway, parole agent Donna Virgilio Mattia from Philadelphia's SCI Chester said, quote, It's like Disney World compared to our prisons. She, alongside 13 other prison officers and six researchers, visited Ringeriki, which sits 40 miles outside of Oslo. Like Bastoy and Halden, it is set in a picturesque woodland surrounding, but it's still surrounded by a 23-foot concrete wall. I'm sorry, I'm not making it easier for him because he every time he says ringarike, I just it makes me think of like a song. <laughs> ringarike. Again, I don't know if that's how they say it. That's why I said how you say it. <laughs> I'm just having an educated guess. From the article, quote, Donald Spector, executive director of the non profit law firm Prison Law Office, was shocked at what he saw when he toured a handful of European prisons in twenty eleven. They were clean, they were run humanely. There were lots of programs. The emphasis was on how you get out, not punishing you while you were there, he said. He decided to organize trips for American prison administrators, politicians, and legislators in the hope that their perspectives could be equally transformed. John Wetzel, secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, was on the first one. So... Wetzel, in turn, convinced the superintendent of SCI Chester to travel to Norway for three weeks with their staff. So here's what they said, quote, For the officers, the experience was a culture shock. What Turquoise Danford found strangest was the morning wake-up routine. 
At SEI Chester, it's loud. There's yelling and inmates must be standing by their doors at 6.15am for counts and cell checks. At Ringariki, quote, They go to each door and say, Good morning. It's just that simple, said Danford. It almost reminds you of your mother waking you up as a small child. Other differences noted by staff were the casual interactions between staff and inmates and the officer's philosophy regarding helping someone change their life versus simply helping to retain someone until the release. Other key differences were that staff seemed more well-adjusted and enjoy their work more. Quote, Corrections officers have higher rates of substance abuse, mental health problems, and suicide. Last year, said Wetzel, there were eight suicides in his department. Oh my god. How do you... <laughs> How how many suicides per year do you get through? Are you when, like, all right, well, that's enough. <laughs> when, yeah, where you're like, oh, maybe we need to change something here. Uh, so, last year, Wetzel said that there were eight suicides in his department. A 2018 study found that prison officers suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder at the same levels as people in war zones, a rate six times higher than the general population. We have a real crisis, said Wetzel. Part of that crisis is, I think, directly attributable to the environment inside facilities. Critics of this stuff often focus on stuff like, oh, soft on crime, hug a thug, all that crap. And the reality is, the staff who are working there are in that environment also. It's a good note. Yeah. I mean... We don't really... We haven't really addressed that in the in the episode thus far, but it has to be... I mean... it. You are creating a toxic work environment mm -hmm. for the and and I mean that almost quite literally, like the amount of abuse that uh corrections correctional, officers corrections officers have to suffer is insane, and you know like if you're day to day you're feared for your safety or you are taught that you have to have a certain amount of power or control over prisoners. Uh, or inmates like that's that affects you yeah. and you you do form bonds with with prisoners and if you're in a violent system you can see those people you know maybe they are they're being failed by the system maybe they are being hurt like i mean we've talked about it before i don't even want to be a public uh school teacher in the uk because <laughs> i <laughs> i don't want to get stabbed or slapped by one of my kids um you know forget going and working in a in a prison but again maybe that's part of the attitude that we need to change so part of the difference here is cost pennsylvania spent $42,727 per inmate in 2015 at halden in south norway widely considered to be the most humane prison in the world the budget is more than 120,000 per inmate yeah yeah big old difference so you could essentially house almost three U.S. or almost three Pennsylvanian prisoners versus one mm -hmm. prisoner at Halden. Uh, bear in mind that Halden is kind of the, let's say, the swankiest in terms of prisons in Norway. Norwegian prison officers also train for two years versus seven weeks in the U.S. Seven weeks? What mm -hmm. are they, police officers? <laughs> oh, <laughs> the number of prison staff is almost equal to the number of inmates. And they have a largely homogenous society with fewer inmates per capita. The USA is much more mixed, with a much higher number of ethnic minorities under incarceration. So the the melting pot that they often talk about in terms of the US can turn into a pressure cooker. And it's not something they have to deal with in the same way in, in Norway. You don't have to be as sensitive to cultural differences in other people if there are fewer of them. Yeah. You mean probably have fewer um I mean I'm sure there are still gangs, but I mean you've got fewer gangs divided on like racial lines yeah. or um, you know, Nazis or Oh, they probably still have their fair share. Oh no, I'm yeah, sure yeah. they still have Nazis, but there are probably fewer like yeah. I mean it's know. trendy right now. It's it's kinda in. I don't mean fewer Nazis, I mean fewer uh I don't know, minorities like me to hate. <laughs> I don't hate you. Thanks. Yeah. All right. 
say all of those are great lessons that we could take to the U.S. Things like better environments for incarcerated people, you know, spending more money, treating people like humans. All of those are great. I wanted to talk about maybe one or two things that has worked in the U.S. Um, first of all, it's sealing and expunging records. In the U.S., criminal uh, records can be sealed or expunged by a judge or a court. Sealed means that they can be seen only with a court order, while expunged means they are no longer recorded anywhere and cannot be seen. This process can be very expensive and time-consuming. You have to file a petition, go to court, have a time period in which you don't reoffend, and it can cost several thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult process, but it's worthwhile. And, and why does it matter? Because according to the Center for American Progress, quote, nearly nine in 10 employers, four in five landlords, and three in five colleges use background checks to screen for applicants' criminal records. And one study found that more than 45,000 federal and state statutes and regulations impose disqualifications or disadvantages on individuals with a conviction. We typically think employers, landlords, and neighbors have a right to know if a criminal is in their midst, but studies have shown that those with sealed or expunged records commit fewer crimes than the general adult population. In fact, quote, in Michigan, for example, 99% of such individual individuals are not convicted of any felony, 99.4% are not convicted of any violent crime, and 96% are not convicted of any crime at all within five years of sealing their criminal records. I imagine if you are going through all of the various legal wranglings of having your record sealed or expunged in the first instance, then you're doing it because you've already committed to yourself that you're not going to commit any more crimes. I mean, what would, what would be the point of having something taken off your record from 10 years ago if this year you go out and do something else that's going to land you in hot water? Yeah, and I think it's also important to note that it's not like everybody can get a sealed no, of or course. expunged conviction, so you can't just like get rid of a murder charge. Um, sure. And, or I imagine a lot of sexual offences probably come under that umbrella as well. Yeah, so basically, like, minor minor offences, a lot of non-convictions. So part of the issue is that your arrest record is, is public. Mm -hmm. So um, an employer can see that you were arrested for something, but you may have never been charged. You may be completely innocent. Mm -hmm. um, and the, And even on, like, a lot of... Like, a lot of job applications, you, you'll you be asked, like, have you ever been arrested? Yeah. Not, have you ever been convicted? They'll just ask if you've been arrested. And when that employer has a stack of CVs in front of them, and mm -hmm. you are just trying to make that all-important good first impression, that... It's a black mark against you. I mean, it's the kind of thing that puts you off going out for jobs in the first place. And so already your life post-conviction, post-arrest, whatever, is is on a different trajectory because of, again, the way that you view yourself. You don't view yourself as on equal footing with anyone else. I mean, hell, like, we're living in the age of anxiety. We're living in the age of poor self-image, right? Add into that, I'm, I'm not as good as you because I have a criminal record. I'm not as good as you because I've been uh, arrested. That's... That, that can be a big toll. That can take a big toll. I think it's also incredibly important in times where, like, we have changed what what's what should be convicted, right? Like, say, for example, in, in my home state in Washington, marijuana is legal. There are plenty of people who have marijuana charges on their record for things like very minor amounts of possession, and yet they still have trouble getting jobs, even though now it is legal. Yes, they did break the law. They broke they broke the law by having possession of an illegal substance. But do they need to continue to pay for that crime for the rest of their life? No. And especially not for something that is now legal. I guess what you're trying to say is uh, roll it up and smoke it. Yeah. Yeah. 420, so, folks. <laughs> there is no federal program for sealing or expunging records. It differs very widely from state to state. 
Many states have allowances for limited felonies and misdemeanor relief. So it completely depends on the state you're in, how left-leaning they are. I mean, Washington is one of the ones that has more major felony relief, but there are states that have absolutely zero. Currently, there are some automatic record clearings in states, typically for those non-convention, like non-convictions that I, I mentioned. A lot of these are very new laws, so they haven't really gone into effect and we can't really see what effect they have. Yeah, we need to look at the long-term data, which mm-hmm. will take years to gather. Yeah. Another program that I wanted to mention is something that U.S. states don't really do anymore, but it was uh, the furlough programs. So a furlough is when a prisoner is allowed to leave the prison and, and return. They can be escorted or unescorted. Furloughs are available for jobs, life events, and to maintain ties with the outside world. Sorry, I think what you meant to say was it's no longer available Unless you're, like, convicted of financial crime. Yeah, exactly. Unless you're, <laughs> unless you're a white-collar criminal, in which case, you, you're basically living your everyday life. But we put this little tag on your, you tanked an entire economy, but, uh, you know, make sure you're back before bedtime. Or not. Up to you. Um, it's not the same as, as, like, a house arrest. But, yeah. So, furloughs used to be common in the 80s, and a study done by the U.S. Department of Justice in 1991 found, quote, even when the effects of other variables such as recidivism risk on the salient factor score, age, race, time served, gender, and type of offense were considered, the furloughed group experienced greater post-release success. The recidivism rate was 32.6% for those granted social furloughs and 52.9% for those who had no furlough. There's nothing I like better than the feeling of some post-release success. <laughs> it's uh, it's Jesus. it's the best feeling around. <laughs> so I hear what they're saying. I think I got your point. <laughs> oh, wink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wink. Reasons for this typically land up on the fact that incarcerated people on furlough can maintain community and familial ties better than those who don't experience furloughs. We also have to account for the selection of prisoners suitable for furlough, they are already going to be those who have a lower possibility for recidivism because you are trusting these people to leave and come back on their own. Yeah. I think, like, furloughs kind of ties into this Norwegian prison system of having places for family, for, like, maintaining those social ties to creating a community so that when you are released, you aren't hit with that sudden shock. And Mm -hmm. I think that's where a a big part of this comes in, is we have, like, issues with violence and inhumane treatment in prisons. We have people in prison for long periods of time when they don't need to be there for that long. And we cut off all ties from the world outside. Yeah, it comes back to that quote from uh, the governor of, of, I think it was the governor of Bastoy, when he was talking about, do you want to release a functioning citizen, or do you want to release a ticking time bomb? And a very good way of releasing a ticking time bomb is having somebody who just doesn't doesn't know how to function in wider society because they've been removed from it for so long. I mean, God, can you can you imagine going into prison before the advent of social media? And then coming out and being told, like... You have to get on LinkedIn in order to get a job. What? I have to be on (laughs) Facebook to get... What was the thing I was telling you the other... Oh, I was thinking about buying a VR headset. I was like, oh, there's some really good prices on these Oculus headsets. You know, oh, cool. This this would be a good Christmas gift, Alicia. (laughs) Alicia, if you were thinking. And then, uh, oh, you have to have a Facebook account to get all up in this VR. I was like, no, no, thank you. Not having Mark Zuckerberg sitting on my... (laughs) Sitting on my face. Sitting on my eye holes. Sitting on my <laughs> <laughs> sitting on my eyeballs. Freaky Mark Zuckerberg. Staring staring directly into your eyes. My point being running his fingers down my face. Oh, uh my dear God, what was I saying? <laughs> my point being, the world the world nowadays, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that because technology is such a such a central part of our lives and because technology begets new technology it becomes faster and faster all the time 
being removed from society, mm-hmm. even for a few years nowadays, if you're completely off the grid, like it's really easy to fall off the track. It's really easy to just to completely lose touch. Um, and that, again, is just another added disadvantage when, you, when you're trying to, you know, break back into the mainstream. Overall, like, these are all things that can be changed within the prison system, but it it's not an isolate, it's not in isolation, right? You, like, us as a society need to do things, like, we need to have police reform. We need to have reform on the laws. We need to have reform on uh, social services. You know, if we have a better social safety net, hopefully fewer people will be incentivized to commit crimes. Yeah, ideally. Um, it, it's not an isolated thing, but the change has to happen somewhere. Mm-hmm. And when you have, we'll come back to those figures again, when you have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the incarcerated people uh, in the world in the same country, that seems like a pretty good starting point. Not in Scotland, though. We're... You're good. <laughs> we got under control, <laughs> folks. No worries. No Increasing problems with drug-related offenses. Anywho, so uh, I think it's weird fact time. Oh, weird fact. Yeah. Um, do you have one locked and loaded, or do you want me to go first? Uh, yeah, I can. I can pull up mine. Cool. All right. Mine is about a prison escape. Cool. Fun. Fun. <laughs> Fun. Good times. Fun. Lighthearted. <laughs> so, in 1986, uh, Michel Valjour, uh and his wife used fruit to escape prison okay um i'm gonna say if you're a man with the name michelle vajour fruit seems like uh <laughs> fruit seems like the way you would go for a prison break what's that supposed to mean uh it just it's an unusual name therefore i mean it, to this me, is in france <laughs> oh <laughs> oh so it's probably just like tom i mean it's, tom it's michael it's literally michelle Go on. Awkward. So these okay. fruits. What fruit do you think they used to escape? Oh, God. Uh, I'm going to say classic banana peel on the floor. Prison Ooh. guard. Whoop. <laughs> A little Kadunk. slippy action. Falls on his head and is knocked out. But then actually he falls on his head and he has a uh, hematoma and they killed him. And now you go back to prison. This is dark. Yeah. Um, Could okay. you string bananas together like a string of sausages and then hang them out a window? And cr- crawl down them. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Or just think I'm very, very hung up on bananas. <laughs> sure Maybe are. you peel the bananas, and you know how banana peels are inherently slippery. You kind of just like oh, all over your body. Just really give yourself a kind of like, just, you just like make yourself slick like a you seal. Just bob slide your and way then, out. And like in that <laughs> first X Men movie, you just like and like try and squeeze your face out between the bars. Mm. Mm-hmm. No, it was nectarines. Fucking who's guessing nectarines? <laughs> Come on. Uh, so his wife took helicopter lessons prior to his escape, and he used a nectar. He used nectarines that he painted to look like grenades. So, Brilliant. <laughs> so he convinced the the correctional officers that he had grenades, and they basically he escaped onto the roof of the prison where his wife picked him up in a helicopter. <laughs> Don't make me use this. <laughs> Please. <laughs> How good are his painting skills? Like, I know, right? <laughs> Where's he getting all this? We should have known. We should have never let him sign up for this art course. But famously, <laughs> we are more about the rehabilitation. So we thought, oh, maybe he could be a street artist. This is France. So, you know, 50% of our economy is uh, mimes and chalk drawings on the pavement. So we thought, let's get this ba- guy back out into the workforce. But, uh, yeah, those were very uh, convincing looking nectarines. He did, uh, he did prove his talent, though. And his wife was taking helicopter. I like the idea that he's funneling money to his wife to take these helicopter lessons. He's like, so the breakout, we're still doing the breakout next Wednesday. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely not leaving you for my helicopter instructor. I'm definitely. That's a committed wife. I know, right? Oh, she probably had a whale of a time. There... She did learn to fly a helicopter. Where did the helicopter come from, though? He's like, I just need you to drop me on the other side of the city where our safe house is. And she's like, yeah, yeah, but look, I could do a loop de loop. Crash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they died te- in a devastating they, helicopter. But crash. they died outside of the prison, and that's the main thing. Uh, no, they were captured. All right. Oh, oh, 
I, they got I, away. They I'm got not away gonna, for a while. I'm not gonna. T- they should have just let them go because they were like, "You convinced us that fruit you got was grenades." Style, man. Yeah, you get a free pass. Nah, he uh, tried to commit a robbery again. Oh <laughs> well, you know, I guess he just didn't. He didn't. He hadn't learned enough life skills. He hadn't focused enough on his paintings. <laughs> exactly. To join that uh, burgeoning artist economy. All right. Do you know who Timothy Leary is? Isn't that like a rhyme? not that i'm aware of okay yeah um so he he was quite a famous figure in the in the counterculture movement in the 1960s primarily because of his research into lsd and uh, psilocybin so during the 1960s did this... we literally talk about him I don't, no i don't think <laughs> okay. we did i don't think we we covered timothy leary uh on our uh three-parter on Operation Midnight Climax, which you should definitely go back and, and listen to if you Will haven't is already. Like, templing his fingers, <laughs> <laughs> as he's Ladies pitching. And gentlemen. So, uh, but yeah, so he he uh, is an American uh, psychiatrist who did, or psychologist, I say, who who did a lot of this research, um, administered a lot of drugs to his students willingly, as far as I'm aware, and took a lot of drugs himself, and fell foul of uh, the politicians of the time, and so. Landed up in prison. Mm-hmm. Now, bear in mind, this guy's a famous psychologist, right? Is he like, yeah, he's a smart dude. Mm-hmm. Smart guy, written a lot of papers. Timothy Leary, upon his arrival at prison in 1970, was given psychological tests used to assign inmates to appropriate work details. Having designed some of these tests himself, <laughs> including the Leary Interpersonal <laughs> Behavior Test, Leary answered them in such a way that he de- that he seemed to be very conforming conventional person with a great interest in forestry and gardening. As a result, he was assigned to work as a gardener in a lower security prison from which he escaped in September 1970. (laughs) Excellent. Can can you imagine your first day in prison, you're like, okay, Leary, step forward, right? We're just going to need you to fill out some forms. And you're like, fuck, okay. And then they put that paper in front of you and you're just trying so hard not to smile and be like, what is that? So I just uh, I just check the boxes, do I? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Suckers. <laughs> Literally on the top, it just says Leary. Your <laughs> personal behavior test. Leary. Uh, it must be. Yes, it's a super common name. There were like a hundred Learys in my hometown. Anyway, I'm finished. He's the one who says, uh, "Turn on, tune in, and drop out." Oh, I, that I didn't know. That I didn't know. Um, but just great advice for yeah. life. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, we we hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, please give us a like, give us a follow, and leave a review. This has been Enter the Rabbit Hole, as always, reminding you to... Bear in mind that everybody deserves a second chance. Some people even deserve a third, fourth, or fifth chance. And that even if you don't believe that... um. Unless you're up for just killing everybody who does so much as litters on the pavement, people are going to end up back in society and you got to ask yourself, what kind of people do you want? So as always, reminding you all those things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Be a good neighbor. <laughs> yes, please do. All right, folks. Take care for now. Bye-bye. Ciao. Enter the Rabbit Hole is written and presented by William Grant and Alicia Palmer. The music was created by Glenn Marshall. More information and sources can be found in the episode description. You can email us at etrhthepod at gmail or follow us on Instagram at etrhthepod. Thanks for listening.